Dr. Micha Goodman is a senior research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, a leading voice on Judaism, Zionism, and the Bible, and the challenges and opportunities facing Israel and contemporary world Jewry. He's the president of the Ain Pratt Academy and the author of Catch 67, uh, which can be read in English. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So given our, um, our, the, our current polarization here in American Jewish life, um, which certainly extends uh, into the Israeli society as well, and the inability to uh, resolve the conflict at any time soon or the, the interaction involved, how might we begin to alleviate some of the suffering that's involved, the historical trauma, the existential angst, the breakdown of relationships and healthy discourse without actually resolving the problems? How might we alleviate some of the suffering involved? I think, Rabbi, this is a very important question. It's the, exactly, the exact question we need to ask today. Because we, we were avoiding this question for many, many years for one reason. We thought we could solve the conflict. So we said to ourselves, we will end, all the suffering will end once we end the conflict. And as a result, the conflict's not ending, and we're not doing anything on the ground to minimize suffering. So, um, so I think today the recognition that the conflict doesn't seem like it's going to end and peace is not around the corner, this recognition could be a good thing. It's not good that we don't have peace, but recognizing it and accepting it could be a good thing. Because as long as moving on the ground to minimize suffering depends on peace, peace, that, peace that's not coming means we're paralyzed and we're not moving on the ground. Not waiting for peace means we're not paralyzed. It actually means we're starting to really move on the ground. So I'm very involved right now in thinking about this with, um, with serious people in Israel and within the, within the Palestinian society. And there are real things we could do on the ground that would shrink dramatically the amount of suffering, the daily suffering. And uh, Rabbi Yaman, you're going to into, into the technical steps that could be done. So, um, this is how a step needs to look like. I feel it has to fit, it has to meet two standards. One, ever, in, in, the, in the West Bank, there are many areas where there is military control, military regime controlling civilian population. I mean, Israeli military uh, forces controlling Palestinian civilian population. Now, many people think that we're always trapped in a zero-sum game, which means the more we control them, the safer we are. The less we control them, so the less safe we are. And it's interesting enough, there are many steps that break this zero-sum game. And this is a good step. What's a good step? A step that shrinks the amount of occupation that Palestinians are suffering from without shrinking the amount of security that Israelis are enjoying. So this is the Talmudic move we're looking for. How to shrink the amount of occupation without shrinking in parallel the amount of security. And for example, um, the historic reality created by Oslo and post-Oslo is the in, the in Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank, is that Palestinians live in autonomous zones and within the autonomous zones, they have a lot of independence and not experiencing a lot of what's called occupation. The problem is that those autonomous zones, Rabbi, are not connected to each other. So let's say you live in Ramallah and you have a cousin in Neblis. So while you live in Ramallah, the te television you're watching is Palestinian TV and the cops are giving you speeding tickets or Palestinian cops. And you're living and you're experiencing independence. And your cousin in Nablus is also experiencing independence. Where's the problem? The problem is every time you leave Ramallah to live your cousin, to, 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 to visit your cousin in Nablus, the road is controlled by Israel, by the Israeli, by the IDF. And that's where the occupation is experienced. The fact that when they leave the autonomous zone to go to another autonomous zone, they have to go through area C. Area C is controlled, is area controlled by Israeli military, and then they can be stopped, there can be checkposts. That's where the, that's where the experience, um, uh, uh, experiences and emotions, which are all suffering. So interestingly enough, there is a very simple answer here. It's almost technical. Why don't we just build a road system that connects all these cities? 
and then give that road system to Palestinian sovereignty. Call it Area A. And then, and if Palestine wants to leave for Hebron and go all the way to Janine, the entire way doesn't see one soldier because the entire time was in a Palestinian road governed. The cops giving speeding tickets are Palestinian cops. By the way, if Jews want to drive those roads, they're invited to. They have to recognize that a Palestinian cop will give them a speeding ticket. That's fine. It's a sovereign Palestinian road. Just like Palestinians can use roads which are sovereign by, Jew, by, by, by Israelis. So here's the thing. The right doesn't like this kind of idea because it's giving land to Palestinians. The left doesn't like this kind of idea because these are all the steps we have to do when we have peace. But if we graduate from the ideology of the sacred settlements and we graduate from the ideology of the sacred peace, this is what we could do. We could do pragmatic steps on the ground that would dramatically increase the amount of occupation without, without um, minimizing the security of Israelis. This is what I call shrinking the conflict. It's not ending the conflict. It's shrinking it. It's what we can do now. And I, halakhically speaking, by the way, Rabbi, if it's something that we could do, I think we have to do it. If there isn't pikuach nefesh, if it doesn't risk Israelis, and it does minimize control of Palestinians, then we have to do it. I think there's about, I wrote a, a piece in The Atlantic about eight steps that could shrink the conflict. I've learned now about 20 steps, and I think we should start doing them. Wow. And not waiting. It's not a Zionist thing to wait. We okay. should start doing Amazing. So moving beyond the small-mindedness and the myopia of, of, of political ideologies that don't move us forward and moving towards a more pragmatic realm that shrinks occupation without shrinking uh, security and breaking down some of those idolatries might be too strong, but breaking down some of those, those, those hard commitments, like you said, towards a hard peace plan or towards toward settlements. And so I guess my next question would be, how, what might classical Jewish philosophy or classical Jewish values have to contribute? Oftentimes we talk about the machloket uh, between emet and shalom, that there's a tension between truth and truth. Yes. But I feel like we're dealing with a new framework here, a pragmatic framework about alleviating suffering, alleviating tension. And what might our, our tradition have to offer to how we think about this path forward? You used a word now before that you said you don't mean it, but I think you actually did. You said idolatry. <laughs> And I think this is, I think we have to, uh, there's a lot to learn about how Maimonides understands idolatry. Or later on, how Yeshayahu Leibovich understands idolatry. And here's one way to think about idolatry. God is, God is perfect and God is one. Which means nothing is perfect in this world. If anything is perfect, so that cracks God's monopoly over perfection. God is one. And therefore, what monotheism trains our mo monotheism trains our mind to accept the fact that nothing in this world is perfect. Now, utopian politics is idolatrous in the sense because you believe that there is an idea that is perfect, and you believe that if human being these ideas that human be who human beings created ideas that are perfect, and if we'll impl implement those ideas, the world will be perfect. Yeah. Well. As a monotheist, I don't think human beings could invent perfect ideas because we're imperfect. And if there's no idea, there's no one idea that if we implement it, the world will be perfect. Not socialism, not communism, not liberalism, not capitalism, not peace. There isn't a perfect idea out there. And I think politics is paralyzed when we're waiting for the perfect solution, we're waiting for peace, we're waiting for perfection. Well, we're always stuck. We're, when you're playing the all or nothing game, you're always stuck with nothing. So I think pragmatic thinking is not ideological thinking, but I think it is theological thinking. I think it really accepts the idea of monotheism. God is perfect in this world. I'm not gonna reject an idea if it's not a perfect idea. Because nothing is perfect. No people are perfect and no ideas are perfect. By the way, I'm a Zionist. I'm a passionate Zionist. I don't think Zionism is a perfect idea. I think when we play, Israel doesn't have to say we're the best country in the world, most ethical army. We don't have to play for perfection. And poke Zionism and say, oh, you're not perfect. I'm rejecting you. Yes, I'm a monotheist and I'm a Zionist, which means I realize Zionism is not perfect and I'm a passionate Zionist. By the way, most of the people that I admire are not perfect. I still admire them and appreciate them. Besides my wife, no one's perfect. <laughs> she's, she's here so i have to love know. it love it okay i love that pragmatism as jewish theology there's a humility to it an epistemic humility there's a uh, it, it it reduces our expectations it, uh, reduces conflict 
Well, thank you, friends. Uh, make sure to read Dr. Me uh, Dr. Micha Goodman's Cat 667 uh, and a bunch of his other writings. He references Atlantic article, article, his book on the Rambam, on Maimonides, on the Kuzari, and many others. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Rabbi.